Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tanisha Shields, and I am a Senior Land Services Officer with Western Local Land Services. Today, we will be, we will be hearing from Dick Richardson from Grazing Naturally about planning growing seasons in Western New South Wales. To begin today's webinar, I will quickly go over some housekeeping. So you should see the following control panel on your screen. If you do not, please click the orange arrow to display the control panel. Here you can choose your audio option. So if you are having issues with your computer audio, you may dial in on your phone. And you can also ask questions. You are in listen only mode, which means that you can hear us, but we cannot hear you. And today's presentation will be re recorded and you will be sent a link to the recording within 24 hours. Throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, you can ask them by typing them into the questions box, which can be seen here on your control panel. Dick will then answer your questions at the end of today's session. I will start today's webinar with a quick poll. This will help us to gauge who is here in the audience and also just to check that the webinar program is working correctly. So I'm just going to launch that first poll now to the audience. So we're collecting poll responses now. You may need to take your webinar screen out of full screen mode if you cannot answer the poll questions. We've got 91% of votes already, so going very well. I'll give you a few more seconds and then I'll close that poll down. Closing the poll now. So I will just share the poll results. So of attendees today, 27% are sheep producers, 9% are goat producers, 18% are cattle producers, 9% are mixed species producers and 36% are advisors. I will just get you all to do one more poll and then we'll hand over to Dick. So launching the second poll now. The second poll question is, how would you describe your current grazing management system? So are you a set stocked grazing system? Do you use planned rotational grazing or is your grazing strategy flexible with the season? We've got 70% of votes, so just a few more seconds for the last few to get their responses in. All right, I'll close that poll down now and share the results with you all. So of the audience there today, 13% of you are set stocked, 63% have a planned rotational grazing system and 25% have a grazing strategy that is flexible with the season. Thank you all for completing those poll questions.
Okay, I will now hand over to Dick. Dick Richardson is an internationally recognised leader in the practice of natural grazing to improve soil depth and health, water retention, increase biodiversity and animal production. So I'll just change you over to the presenter now, Dick, and let you get on with the session. Thanks, Tanisha. Well, welcome, everybody. A different not being able to see any faces with people we're talking to and things like that. But anyway, as we move through this, hopefully I'll get to know some of your names and you send in questions later on. If, if I know you, it would be nice to know that you're here today. So the game today really is to talk about growing season grazing management and in the introduction there you heard from Tanisha that my background really and the stuff that I work in is trying to mimic natural processes in the development of soil depth maturity and health so what does soil depth and maturity really mean I suppose the good place to start soil depth really is in the maturity of it is that a mature soil has got more space in it than it's got mineral. Most people tend in Australia to call soils dirt. Pisses me off, but anyway, they do. Soil's actually not dirt. It's an it's that dirt is an inert sort of thing. It's a thing that your mother sends you to wash up your face before dinner. So soil is a living thing which has more space in it than solid mineral. So it's made up of air, water which have to both fit in spaces, although the water attaches to organic, humic, or to mineral particles. And then you've got the organic particle part of it, which is really anything living, I suppose, <clears throat> all the living organisms in there, and people called previously living stuff organic, but it's no longer really organic. But you have, carboniferous material which was once upon a time a live thing and that there can be broken into two different uh, sections which we'll do in a second but uh, just before that basically you left in with the mineral portion so a mature soil has got lots of space between the mineral portions and it's got quite a, a large currently living or previously living organic matter side of it and of course there is another section in there, where, as we said, when we break up organic activity, we break that up into the living bit and then the dead bit. But then we also have this other portion of it, which is humus. So humus is a long-term construct. It's not a deconstruction. It is a construct of, particle, of, of elements, which then make up around carbon. It's a hexagonal shaped helix. And like a spring, basically, in Walter, Walter Yaney, that Professor Walter Yaney calls them carbon springs. So it's these humus particles that actually hold the mineral particles apart in the soil. So although we do want high organic matter in, in soils, we, we once again, we've got to just remind ourselves there's a living portion, then there's a dead portion. There's a shortly dead portion, and uh, that's going to turn around, and some of that might have been there a while but that labile carbon is able to move in and out of soil. But the key thing is to be able to put down humus, which is a long-term construct, which is made by biological activity. In other words, living organisms make it. They make it in a relationship between plants and the living organism. The plant gives them the nutrient to do so. The living organisms build these little humus structures. The humus structures then hold the soil particles apart. So when it comes to managing landscapes for healthy soils and mature soils, we then obviously have to understand how that works and we have to try and somehow drive the soil building process in soils. Now, most schools you go to would teach you simply to put lots of organic matter down on soil surface and that this organic matter on the soil surface then will work its way down into the soil by some sort of magic and that's mostly known as decomposition and in that process supposedly will build your soil but 
a minute ago, I pointed out that humus is a construction, not a deconstruction. And decomposition is about deconstruction. So only a very small per percentage of deconstructed organic matter left behind on the soil or lying around in the soil is going to ever end up being built into this construct of humus, which is what develops soil structure. Very, very small percentage. In fact, leading soil people like Walter Yaney, Dr. Christine Jones, all these people will tell you that it's way south less than 5% of the total carbon in a soil, even in a rangeland type of soil, would be able to have come from litter left at soil surface. So if this is the case, does that mean covering soils is unimportant? The answer to that question is no. You do want soil cover. But in soil cover, what we mean is just some soil cover to give you some shade, to slow down a raindrop impact, and to allow temperature variations to be controlled to some degree. But this is definitely not a mulch. Anybody listening here today who's got a garden, anybody who grows anything, and you fellas in Western New South Wales there, you ladies and gentlemen out there on those blocks, you often have little veggie patches. Well, you know, to conserve water and to stop weeds growing in there, you will put a mulch on that soil. Well, nearly every single plant that grows in Western New South Wales could be classified as a weed by someone because many of them are not perennial they little annual little lettuce and things like that if you like from a veggie garden as type of perspective with different root systems etc these things if you've got a thick humus layer on the surface sorry a thick not a humus layer lay, lay, it was called a humus layer once upon a time if you've got a thick mulch layer on soil surface you'll get none of that stuff coming through so no, we don't want a thick mulch in any way at all. We just want some literate soil service if we can. But what we want it to do is give construction to humus underground. So this is a hell of an important thing. A, it requires biodiversity. We can go down a whole line of biodiversity. It needs grasses, it needs different kinds of forbs to do this job. But forbs and grasses together can get this right. It's not a job that trees do. It's a job that some forbs do, and they'll do it when they're in conjunction with the grassland. So what happens is these plants, and this is particularly now a grass plant we're gonna be showing you here. However, forbs, and I'll, I'll identify where they don't work the same, forbs work the same to some degree. So in the early part of a growth phase of these plants, you will find that your growth rate is relatively slow. So in a phase one, you'll have a very slow growth scenario. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see my mouse there. I don't know whether I shouldn't have a little pointer job somewhere in there with a red light or something. Yell if there is, is such a thing. Drawing tools, no, well you'll yell if you want me to use something else there, Tunisia. But slow growth at the beginning phase here while you're building up a little bit of uh, plant material. After that, the speed of the growth begins to increase and the plants will begin to take off. Now, there's a point here where plants differ. Grasses will have their meristem, that's the actual growth point of a grass, is way down near soil surface. So right down near the root system and at about three to four, maybe so leaves there, you will get your greatest levels of sugar in the plant compared to nitrogen and you'll get your best nutritional value because your 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 build up of dry matter hasn't got to the level yet where digestibility drops off so you have a highly digestible plant at the bottom end here but what happens is the meristem that's the growth point of this plant will somewhere around about its six leaves way down at soil surface in the meristem begin to create its reproductive material. So it starts to create its seed head way down in the bottom here. The moment that happens, this plant has a change about a kernel. It goes from being a plant that's only interested in two things. One, in produ producing vegetative material and B, managing the soil systems around it. 
to a plant that then begins to worry only about its children and how it's going to be able to push as much nutrient as possible into the children. So in the early stages of growth here, the infrastructure that the plant puts up to raise a growth, uh, its, its seed heads, etc., which it does later on, is minimal. These leaves are highly digestible, not a lot of infrastructure going into them, so not a big cost in terms of energy to the plant. In that time, the extra energy that plant has around it, it utilizes to push root exudates into the ground around it. So the root exudate pr productivity is exceptionally high during this initial phase all the way to the reproductive phase. If this is a grass plant which has just been grazed, it'll be within 20 minutes that that near max flow of sugars into the soil around its root system occurs. So why are these sugars flowing into the soil important? Those of you who've heard me before would know about this. These sugar flows going into the rhizosphere is what feeds the biology in the soil. So this is what feeds nitrogen fixing bacteria. For grasses, these are free living nitrogen fixing bacteria. They're not rhizobium, this family the same as you get with and legumes. So all forbs have, have two choices to get their nitrogen. One, they live in amongst grasses, and these grasses populate the soil with their own zygobacters, one of the families, free living bacteria that can fix nitrogen. Those forbs will then also exudate sugars up to the point where they're going to become reproductive. And they will flow that sugar into the soil around their root systems again to feed these bugs. One whole set of these bugs are the ones that fix nitrogen and make nitrogen available back to the plant. However, legumes, legumes are forbs, you get tree legumes as well. The legumes work the same way, but you do not get grass legumes. So what they mean by legume is that it's a plant that has a direct endophytic relationship with rhizobium bacteria. In other words, the plant has a, a bacteria that live in a gall within the plant and actually fix nitrogen directly for the plant. But the sugars that are being fed to those bacteria for nitrogen are not released loose into the soil. They are given directly to that bug, that bacteria in this case, for fixing the nitrogen. So, Plant, grass plants and non-leguminous forbs in a combination and grasses on their own, but better with that combination of forbs and grasses, can achieve as much nitrogen as they want. In fact, much higher levels of nitrogen fixation for themselves without legumes than they would than legumes will do. Again, though this only occurs in this early por portion here. So that's a nitrogen cycle, but what about the carbon? side of it. Well, the, most of those bugs that are living in the riser sheets, in other words, a little zone right against the roots, if you dig out a healthy grass plant, you will find that it's and that is not too old. You will find that its roots are covered in sheets of sticky soil, which look a bit like dreadlocks, to use Christine Jones's term for them, and they look like dreadlocks and not sort of a opened a picture of one of those earlier on. I'll grab one later on in the show. And these dreadlock sections is where all the sugars are flowing into and these bugs are able to do A, the nitrogen fixing ones, but B, the other ones using that sugar to feed themselves begin to construct humus particles. And so this construction then puts these soil mineral particles apart and holds them apart over time. So it's very important for soil structure development to have a mixture of grass and forbs who are pushing sugars into their, around their root systems, into their rhizosphere in the forms of riser sheets there so that they can feed these bugs to do it. Grasses and forbs working together will tend to build most of their humus below the sort of 20 centimeter mark. So 200 mils downwards or to 350 mil is sort of the main depth that they would work at in the evolution of this 
humus. So what happens is the moment these plants move beyond the vegetative phase, so right up to that veg the, the, the beginning of the reproductive phase, which again with grasses occurs right down in the base, you haven't seen the seed head, but it's begun to develop right down in the meristem. So once that meristem evolves into a reproductive production, well then the sugar flows drop off dramatically and the plant begins to put its energy into A, looking after and building that reproductive material, but B, into putting into the infrastructure that it's going to take to be able to hold a seed head above ground. So you think about the weight of a seed head compared to just the weight of a leaf, which is just going to operate as a green leaf, they're totally different. So the infrastructure that goes into holding up seed heads is heaps more than just pushing up a leaf that's going to have to capture sunlight. So what happens is your, your yield may be increasing and at that point in a much more rapid rate. However, your pasture quality drops right off because you've now got a lower digestibility in that feed. So you, this occurs at that point about when the meristem has turned reproductive and it'll obviously not just be uh, gray or black and then white, it's a grayish sort of change over zone, but the energy of the plant is going into the evolution of the seed head and the infrastructure to hold it up. So if that was a forb now, forb is the word I guess suddenly that a lot of Aussies don't know. So this is a, it's the, it's not a shrub or a tree, which is hard on the inside and the grow and it moves its nutrient and, and moisture up around the outside of it, but it lays down its woodiness on the outside and they're often hollow on the inside or filled with pith. So pith is not what happens when you had too much beer and you have to duck out of the room at two o'clock in the morning. Um, but pith is that styrofoam looking stuff like that little eskies up with it, etc. That's uh, what the, some of these falls will line themselves with inside them. So le a legume like lucerne, for example, is a fall and it's got that pith on the inside. If you look at the, like a clover, for example, it's hollow on the inside and that is also a four so that's quite different to how a tree or a shrub grows with a hard wooden side so anyway back to these forbs the forbs tend to obviously aerially build their reproductive material that doesn't start right down inside the leaf sheath rolled up sheath of the grass plant being pushed up it's built way up in the air so you can normally begin to see the flowers evolving on those plants and a lot of you People out there would know your lucerne plants, for example, at about a 10% flower, your lucerne quality drops off quite dramatically. So at a 10% flower, that plant is ch changed. It's already changed its meristems, which are all up the plant, its little growth centers, and it's beginning to change to reproductive material. Sure, you may get quite a bit more production at that point. However, what happens is that plant stops worrying about it evolving or the evolution or generation of mature soil around its root system for long-term health but it actually then develops its seeds for its next generation which it's more worried about getting them right than the other way around so what happens then is you have less sugar less feed being given to your soil microbial population which includes a the bacteria that that are going to fix nitrogen, but be the myriad of other, other organisms in there who potentially can create humus particles, as I said, construct humus, which can build soil structure. There's also another side to this, which is so important. If you take the total growth of a plant, you can look this up on irrigation um, calculators, up to the point in time where the plants become maturing, in other words, begin to become reproductive, and this is true for forbs and grasses, if a plant uses one unit of water to create one kilogram of dry matter, then before that reproductive phase, those plants will use 0.4 of a unit of water. 
the moment they become reproductive, that maturing phase will change to 1.8 times the average water use per kilogram of dry matter. And only right over here at the end in the final polishing of seed and the hardening of seed, etc., does that drop back down to 0.4. So 0.4 water use here, 0.4 water use there, 1.8 in this middle zone here. So this is a hell of important because what we're talking about here is the ability to a if we can keep plants young and before the reproductive stage the ability to a create soil structure develop humus and b do that at a low water cost low soil water cost my knowledge of western new south wales is that your limiting factor at any stage over multiple years is water resources soil water so if you can stretch that water use for production of dry matter above ground you're on the win now of course one of the things that goes through people's minds when i tell you that is oh what about evaporation from the bare ground in between the plants tick well these figures these irrigation figures with the point four includes evaporation from the bare ground before the plants actually canopy so in effect that would mean something like 0.2 usage by the plant say and 0.2 being evaporation and during the maturing phase when they reckon canopying has occurred with the irrigated crops in other words it's covered the soil in between so they've discounted evaporation now it's all going through transpiration and that's 1.8 use so you had a bit of evaporation in between all the time in western new south wales and you're looking at uh, really silly figures there of like 0 0.1 through transpiration and you know 1.8 sorry 2.4 or something when you get into the heat of the growth phase later on so this is going through this is to give you a background as to why it is so important to keep plants in a productive rep, uh, vegetative state rather than letting them become reproductive. A, it saves you water. B, it builds soil structure, potential for building soil structure. C, it increases soil biological life altogether because there's more feed source being given to them. D, it gives you a better quality of feed that you're looking at in that scenario. And lastly, you put that all together, it gives you more total production because you can reuse a paddock a number of times. So if you take a loosened paddock, for example, and you get split that in half and they're both just hitting flower and you cut the one and you take 25 bales off it, the other one you leave, and you go back four weeks later and you take another 20 bales off the one on the left and the other one you leave and then you go back another three or four weeks later and you take another 20 bales off the one on the left and you leave the other the total production on the left now has been already 65 bales the one on the right is not going to produce you 65 bales if it was going to do uh, 25 at first flowering it's not going to do more than like 35 so you know more than double the production by multiple uses now the difficulty for you guys is that you don't often have extended growing seasons although you do when you get a good autumn late summer autumn that then stretches into winter which i believe many of you having this season which is pretty good so in those scenarios is where it's most important to keep a longer growth phase going so in terms of matching stocking rate to carrying capacity that which is one of the principles of grazing naturally we're always going to try and match stocking rate to current carrying capacity as grazing naturally i don't really believe much in long-term norms because they're always built around some theory about how much it's going to rain but none of us ever know what rain we're going to get and the rain is the one thing it gets more sometimes less than others huge amounts too much too little etc so we can't be working on long-term norms you have to try and 
match current carrying capacity. And this way we can increase total carrying capacity, A, and B, we can have greater carrying util stocking rates during our higher carrying capacity periods during the wet the growing or wet seasons. So how do we do this in a growing scenario on property? Well, this is where grazing naturally tries to drive because an evolution of methods. I've used both the fented drivers grazing method and the savory grazing method and the holistic management plan grazing and cell grazing. Although those two are quite close cousins. Those three rather are quite close cousins. Plus the multiple paddock rotations that they've had in South Africa since the 70s when set stocking was banned across the country. I've developed what is now called the grazing naturally method. To get that right, you need seven paddocks or seven zones of paddocks. It starts working anywhere from three paddocks onwards. But if you can get out to seven, it would be at its, its optimum beginning phases. But you can take that up to a max of, let's say, 28 paddocks, where you'd have four in each of these zones. So what we do is we break our paddocks up for each mob into seven zones. And in year one, the one zone of paddocks or a paddock is a priority paddock. The second choice, third choice, fourth, fifth, sixth, and then a Sabbath zone. The Sabbath zone is not going to be grazed in that year, but you priority one of these zones or one of these paddocks. And what we do in that paddock is you would put down, say, a beer can standing up, fill it up with sand, because you wouldn't want to put one out there that's got beer in it and wasted. So one lying down on its side, for example, and you would graze this paddock until you can clearly see the one lying on its side, clearly see it. That's in amongst plants, obviously not on the bare ground, patches in between. And then graze away from the priority zone towards zone two and zone three and zone four. But returning to zone one, the moment it begins to hide the beer can, again, that's standing up from the side. So you've got to, it's, we're thinking of that from the side, okay, and with a plant standing next to it. So when that happens, you immediately stop what you're doing with those animals moving away and drop back to the priority paddock. So that we have some paddocks, in this case, our priority, zone two and zone three, potentially being kept in this highly vegetative, high sugar flow into the soil, high quality production type of situation. Pushing biology underground and evolving those soils. Where, where this happens in an overgrazed paddock, if you I mean, not an overgrazed paddock, my apologies, in a set stock situation, what happens is the animals return to these plants before they reach that third or fourth leaf stage, which is the more or less a standing beer can, in which case they can overgraze those plants. I'm not too worried about overgrazing, but that's what happens during a set stocking is that they can come back to those plants too soon. When we do this, what we do when we come back to a standing beer can of feed, what we're doing is ensuring that that real tender phase of that plant in the first one, two leaves, maybe even three leaves, has got past that before we come back and graze them again. In the dairy industry, they know about getting how much milk they get as to what's happening in a paddock every day, and they do that twice a day, and they've learned that to keep a plant between three and four leaves is the best balance between nutrition for dairy cow milk production, although they'd prefer three because the protein's higher, but four is where the sugar levels come up and they get paid more for, for the nitrogen part of it. In other words, the total milk production rather than for the butter fat, which would increase with the sugar. So they keep it somewhere between two to three leaves but they know if they drop to two, the pasture longevity drops away real quickly. If they get it out to three, the pasture longevity is a bit bigger. And nowadays, a lot of dairies in the more organic or biodynamic world are getting to the fourth leaf because they're being paid on butterfat content and their pastures last them for ages. In fact, they build soil under them instead. So drop back to the priority, graze away, drop back to the priority and graze away. That way, some paddocks that's normally, it's definitely zone seven, 
which is your Sabbath zone, which you're not planning to get to for about 12 months. But zone six and sometimes zone five might get away without a graze through a growing season. So you would have some seed setting for replacement, especially in your annual type of country. And if that happens once in seven years in the Sabbath country, that's good enough. But your priority grazing tends to stretch from at least three of the, the zones of paddocks. So now the standout thing is the following wet season or following growing season, what was your priority paddock becomes your Sabbath paddock. And what was zone two becomes your now priority paddock. So if you take your laziest or worst paddock on the property, the one most of you would choose to shut up and not use, but you try and put as much grazing into that paddock as you can to evolve the community of organisms in there into a grazing based society or culture of community, then you would make that paddock zone four so it gets one, two, three, four years of more intense, more frequent utilization. Then and only then do you Sabbath that paddock. So over a period of seven years, a paddock would have gone through all the variables in the situation that you're looking at. So it would have been a, a priority in one year, Sabbath in another year, and each of the other zones and the others. So that's what we're trying to drive for. Now, just to wrap this up a little bit, right down at the bottom here, not non-growing seasons, a different story, but hopefully Tanisha organizes another day for us to talk about that. And we can then shoot down to the key take on home points of grazing naturally here. So these, some of these we didn't cover today, but <clears throat> nature works in patterns and holes. It's the pattern that creates the hole. One of the things grazing naturally is striving to do is break pattern because pattern leads to simplification in, eco in ecosystems. So it's the change, this is what they'll put on my gravestone one day, change equals change, change the pattern and you'll change the whole ecosystem. So even if you don't take on the whole of that grazing naturally pattern there, what we're wanting you to do is to concentrate on just bringing about change. So if you've got a paddock that's been set stock for many years, let's just leave it open for a year. Let's leave it off for a Sabbath. If you've got paddocks that have been run every year from weaning as with the weaners, well, this year, let's lamb in there. If the paddocks that you lamb in every year, let's give that a break from that time of year, et cetera. So grazing naturally is all about creating a fit for purpose grazing area orientated community of organisms. We didn't go into that today, but there's a humongous difference between how a grazing orientated community operates and how a decomposition e community operates. You notice with this grazing community, with the building of the soils, the feeding of animals, I haven't once mentioned the word decomposition because decomposition is not part of a grazing ecosystem and a grazing community. What happens there is most of what's grown goes through the digestion pathway, which is a fermentation pathway, not a decomposition pathway in dick terms, right? Okay, so a woodland would be a decomposition pathway. So would all those big thick shrubland areas you guys would get, you know, around the Western districts there. It's important to remember that form in an ecosystem will always follow the functions of that form. So if we make the functions in our form grazing, we push as much grazing as we possibly can into country. We make those plants uh, adjust themselves to, to re really frequent intense grazes, then the form of that community will follow. It'll become a grazing based ecosystem. Undergrazing of plants and or too much litter. Light grazing will lead you to moribund grasses, will increase your visible saprotrophs. Those are those white fungi you see in soils. It'll increase um, white ant populations and all of that will lead to fungal attack on grass and forb roots. And it'll move you to a decomposition family of forbs and decomposition shrubs and trees, which will lead to more and more tree and bush encroachment. So visible saprotrophs are not good for these grasses. You, I'm not going to bother with the animal density one with you guys, but you can end up with short 
vibrant, highly mineralized paddocks where the color is dark green, and those will hold on green way after the rest of the district has dried off and gone because it's all gone to seed head and your water use is massively increased in that period of time. So key principles of grazing naturally, just before we duck off to questions, we will always be matching stocking rate to carrying capacity, very important. In the growing seasons, we always concentrate on a priority paddock and put as much grazing into that paddock as we can once it reaches a beer can high. Adjusting stock numbers as the season pro progress becomes really easy. If you're moving out to zone five, then it's telling you, mate, the season's not really working. You need to potentially start dropping your stock numbers to extend the period of time you've got. We always maximize our animal performance in the growing season because we're putting animals back onto the ideal quality feed. We do calculate graze periods and there's a method around that. I'm not going to worry about that obviously in a short show like this one. In the non-growing season, we put the appropriate stock cl classes on the appropriate feed. We monitor animal behavior, ensure that the water systems are up to scratch. We limit our stock densities because animals don't graze at high stock densities. They hate grazing at high stock densities because of the fouling effect of other animals. And high stock densities will always result in poor animal performance. And uh, those chaps who want to get uh, one arm hanging lower than the other, looking like a bull rider been strapping themselves to an animal for a long time, from rolling up temporary fences and miles of it every day, my graze periods of daily moves will only result in animals being mentally unstable. And uh, if possible, do your stock moves once your stock are getting ready to move off the waters. This will obviously works for cattle. Sheep do their main graze in the morning once they're moving off the water. So early in the morning for sheep, late afternoon for cattle. So there are my details at the bottom of that screen. We'll leave them open there for a little while. Just as a Reminder then, before we go to questions, what we're trying to do is keep as much of the property, obviously not all seven zones, but let's say four sevens, nice and short and repetitively, frequently, intensively grazed to push sugar flows into the soil. The sugar flow in the soil is what builds the feed quotient for the soil biology. It's that soil biology then with the sugars the plants give them that can build humus, which builds deeper, and more mature soils. In the end, this is about getting better water utilization, keeping the plants younger, but B, being able to capture that water and hold it in the soil for longer. Right up, Tanisha, that sounded a bit like an auctioneer going, but luckily everyone can listen to it again, I imagine. How are we going? Yes, that's exactly right. Thank you very much, Dick. I we have a few questions that have come through now, and I'd just like to remind everyone in the audience that if they have any questions, please type them into the question box so that we can get them answered. The first question that we have, Dick, is, when you get the first break out of drought, how do you balance utilising feed to make money and let country recover? You don't need to let it recover. It's not trying to recover, and a portion of your property will recover in terms of like a definition from like a holistic management. They're always trying to give you a definition of recovery. Those things are normally 100% off. You cannot get so called recovery correct, you cannot get it right. In fact, all you're trying to do is to keep as much of that property in the prime growing phase as you can. You're obviously going to not want to use all seventh, seven sevenths. You're going to definitely let one go to set heat, set seed, but there's heaps of seed in your country. Your best bet is to keep it short and utilize. Don't worry about recovery. You're going to have to put some animals somewhere to start the season at the first break, put them in that paddock, and in your first season of grazing naturally, use that as your priority paddock. Already put the beer cans out there, graze away from that one, but come back to it at the moment you've got some plants in there that are beginning to hide a beer can 
and at least keep those active and growing. Thank you, Dick. Um, the next question is, how long can we extend our growing season by reducing our mob numbers from say 10 down to two? You, you're going to make your, you're going to shorten your growing season. If I take my numbers from 10 to two animals, all I'm going to do is let more stuff go to seed and it'll use more water. And as I showed you a minute ago, you'll end up with less feed. During a growing season, you shouldn't be trying to, it, unless you can't, it can't keep up with you. In other words, you're getting through to zone five and six towards seven. Then you obviously have to drop stock numbers. But dropping stock numbers into a growing season is counterproductive. I know this sounds counterintuitive to you, but dropping your stock numbers into a growing season will result in a shorter growing season for you. Keeping more of your plants in the active growing phase will save you the water and will end up with the plants becoming greener. So in fact, most people should be running almost 40 times the stock numbers during the wet or growing phases than they do during the dry season. That's interesting and that leads in pretty well to the next question, Dick, which was about more about specific species. So for example, managing plants such as salt bushes during a grow growing season, how would you go about this? So what I would be trying to do with something like salt bush is, and this is if you've planted salt bush with adequate row spacings and things like that, so that there are other plants and species present. If it's the goat farmer speaking, well, maybe the goats are going to stick on the on the brow side of things. This may be a bit different, but if you are going to push that the stuff in between your salt bush is being kept youthful and not allowing that to get over a beer can, you're coming back, not get over a beer can, you're coming back, or just get your beer can and come back, sorry, then you will keep the stuff in between the salt bush pumping and more nutritious. And that should take the animal's minds off the rest of the browse element. It's only with the goats that that's going to be a bit of a, an issue. But a goat is a browser until there's better tucker in between the brows. So brows being the eating of forbs and shrubs and trees, grazing being the utilization of grass species. So a goat, the moment that the feed in between the main browse species is better quality, the goat stops browsing and goes on to more grazing as a percentage of its total feed. So salt bush or not in a paddock, concentrate on getting the stuff in between working that'll develop your soil structure for you. A salt bush is not going to do any soil development in any case. It is, a, it is a shrub and it is going to be part of the decomposition pathway and it can create litter onto soil surface, but it's um, one of those shrubs which can get on in a positive way with grazing ecosystems of forbs and grasses. It's not antagonistic to a grazing ecosystem. But if the stuff in between is being kept healthy and vibrant, your brows will get ignored to a greater degree. And that'll give those salt bushes a chance to crack on a bit. Now, remember that there is a Sabbath paddock. So whoever asked that question has got to remember that every sixth possibly growing season and definitely the seventh growing season, that salt bush gets a chance to grow right out and do its seed growth and replenish all its browse on it. So it's essential that if you're going to be priority grazing, you're going to create a Sabbath at the same time. But it happens automatically because the moment you're going to return to the prime condition paddock, you're going to have to drop some other country out unless you're overstocked. So this ties back into the previous question, Tanisha, you're right, that if you're getting too far out there, then you're overstocked. And that means that you're putting pressure on your likelihood of being able to get a paddock through to a Sabbath event or at least close to a Sabbath event. If it's a terrible time that occurs, well, you do have that Sabbath event up your sleeve 
to help you get out of the problem. So this is still a drought risk management strategy as well. Thank you. We've had a, another question come through. What is considered a too high density number in this environment? Isn't performance a function of quality and quantity, assuming animals are handled well and settled? A stock density that requires you to move animals every day is going to be too high. A. B. Anywhere where you turn animals into a paddock to graze and they are 10 minutes, half an hour later, two hours later, are all equidistant distant apart in that paddock, your stock density is too high. So in your part of the world, actually, stock densities being too high can be reached really easily because you have a high number of plants that you're dealing with in that environment, environment that produce strong and strongly produce phytotoxins. In other words, chemical released into the plant itself, which then makes that plant A, less palatable, or B, toxic to a certain degree, or C, toxic to a hell of a degree. These plants use these phytotoxins to limit the amount of browse taking place on it. Some grasses do it to limit the amount of grazing as well. However, forbs tend to do this by put, passing pheromones downwind. In other words, they release pheromones onto the, onto the air, which then travel down breeze and warn the plants ahead of the grazer browser that then pushes, that plant can then push up its phytotoxins ahead of the browser getting there. Grasses, there are a few that will do it with pheromones above ground, like lemon wiregrass, um, carotene grass, uh, that sort of people will do that above ground, that uh, Indian cooch, which they have a lot of in northern Queensland, for example, above ground, but they are real low biodiversity type grasses, lower order grasses, even in the grasses, which are the higher order plants. In other words, evolved more recently, higher successional plants. These plants are, some of them are older and still use above ground uh, pheromones, but the more modern evolved ones have that have evolved with the modern fungi, which is your like your mycorrhizae of fungi, all invisible fungi. Um, these chaps here will now communicate below ground by letting the message go into the mycorrhizae of fungi out of their root systems. And you can get ahead of grazing animals. You can get a drop in sugar production in the leaves. You can get an increase in terpenes and things to make those plants less palatable. A or B, even a little bit more toxic. So in these cases where you've got a lot of browse element in your paddocks, it's very easy to go over a good density of animals because the messages get across the entire paddock. So in Falbos country in Southern Africa, for example, it's Tarkananthus. It's the same plant that's the most common around Alice Springs was the most common plant on my place in South Africa. They've been on both continents since Gondwana days. That plant at a, at a stock density of round about even 60 cattle per hectare, which is a pretty low density, you will end up getting those plants communi communicating and becoming deadly toxic to other animals. So it's not a direct line. But anywhere where animals' ability to select is limited, your densities have got too high. So in your country, where animals do get a bit of browse and like browsing, they need to browse that country into the breeze or in, into the wind, and they need time for that toxicity, the beehive humming sort of thing of news in the browse to drop away. So you've got to be really careful of densities. Thank you, Dick. There is quite a lot involved in choosing the correct stock density. And for that, someone in the audience has asked, does your system use a grazing chart? 
Yeah, people always ask about a grazing chart. The question is, what do you think a grazing chart is? There are two things in Australia that are generally called grazing charts by different people. The one is a chart where you would record planned grazes and or actual grazes utilised in paddocks or put into paddocks. That is a grazing plan and control chart as the holistic management people call it. I definitely use that for planning grazing. I definitely use it for keeping record. We mostly use it on the Maya grazing uh, tablet form, which runs on your computer so that I can see what my clients are doing. But yes, you can run that. The second thing that's co often called a grazing chart in Australia is really just a trend line mapping your kilograms of dry matter or stock days per hectare per 100 millimetre as a form of getting gaining information in terms of your stocking rate to carrying capacity. I also use that with a lot of my clients, although it's pretty useless most of the time, it does give us an additional insight into the management of our stocking rate to carrying capacity. But it's low on our list of priorities for stocking rate to carrying capacity. We have much better methods then that like, for example, how far down our priority paddocks we're getting in the wet season, A, and then B, we teach people to use the stack method of calculating feed. It's a method that I, uh, what's the word, evolved or uh, evolutionarized from the US and uh, it means sole, toe, ankle, calf, that you can use for calculating how much feed is in a paddock. And we use that when we go into non-growing seasons and we plan those close seasons out. So yes, we use record keeping of moves and plans, plus we do use the trend line, but the trend line is less important than the ones where you plot moves and plan moves. Great, thank you, Dick. We have one last question that's come through. I'll just remind the audience, if you have any final questions, please put them in now as we're nearing 5.30. Um, would you be able to provide some information on soil management with sandy soil? I have been practicing no-till and cover cropping, so looking to Okay, can you still hear me, Tanisha? Because you can. broke up there. You can? Cool. Right. Up. So I didn't get that whole question. Have I got any insights on managing sandy country? Uh, oh, mate, you asked the question uses uh, cover cropping, and uh, I believe I heard. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, yeah, I've got clients who have properties on non-wetting sand. My own block is relatively non-wetting until we've managed to get the bugs to eat the waxes off the sand particles. Then it becomes a little bit more, it likes water a little bit more. But if you go out for a, a wee in the paddock here during the, the summer months, you, you better be a bit of a twinkle toes because it'll take off across the paddock like a black snake trying to get catch your feet. That's how non-wetting it is. So yeah, sand, loams, doesn't matter. You can deal with any of these scenarios. And the principles remain exactly the same. It's about getting green living plants into that country. And it's the keeping them green for longer and a biodiversity of plants in there, which will build your soil structure. Putting organic matter on top of sands you'd like to have a little bit because that wants to wanting to keep it covered will keep the bugs keeping the wax off it for a little longer to so it doesn't become non-wetting however if you you will in a real sandy country never ever build any soil whatsoever at all by having litter on top of the soil it's not the litter that'll build it it's the soil it's built through the actions of the sugar flow from root systems to the organisms around them so sand has a couple of other critical things which are important to bear in mind the first one is displacement so when an animal's footprint gets made in a sandy patch 
you have a wide displacement of soil movement laterally out from there. So one hoof print will create quite a disruption on a widening thing from sand. Sand also, therefore, because of that, actually compacts more than other soils do in a general day-to-day -day number. So a high clay, it's got to have the right water content, or a good loam, it's got to have the correct water content in it at the time to compact. But sand can compact any time of the year with animals moving on top of it, and the compaction is just not all that obvious. However, there's a wonderful trick to sand. Sand has a built-in, in the dry, arid areas of the world, method of creating its own insulation at soil surface. So you can end up with a little bit of a loose sand drift. You'll get it where it'll blow a little bit and cover perennial grasses and forbs and just make a little sand dune like an inch deep over there. And that keeps that plant alive through the long, hot, dry months. And then when the rain comes, it just washes it back off that plant and the plant can grow again. So sand actually has ways of looking after itself to a huge extent. The other thing about sand that we've got to bear in mind is that it catches water real easy because the particles are widely set apart because of the coarseness of sand. Water gets into sand real easily. And conversely, water doesn't get out of a sand really easily because the capillary action is not in place. So a tight soil has a high capillary action. In other words, water can be drawn up from great depths and, to, and evaporated from soil surface. With sand, it doesn't happen to the same degree. So if you down here in South Australia, there's a heap of sand. Anybody who wants to look at sand, just come and visit us. And on our sand ridges with clients' places in the southeast, um, further towards the northern end of it, but west of uh, Western against the Western Vic border, so it's the eastern South Australia. We've got people on sand there. And on the back end of each sand ridge, we still have green growing plants right through the summer in those patches because the water can't all be pulled out of the sand. So sand really a non-issue um, in terms of production and in terms of the use with grazing naturally as well. You shouldn't have a problem with very good production on sand. In fact, soil biology tends to get cracking much better in sand than it does in heavy clays for exactly the reason I was saying earlier on. The water gets in it easier, there's still air available lower down too. So yeah, sand's not an issue. I don't know about, I didn't get to our question, so I may have missed something there. Uh, that is great. Thank you, Dick. I think that will make the person that asked that question feel very happy that they can manage their sand. That appears to be all of our questions. So I will just change back to make me the presenter and we will close today's webinar. So in closing, I would okay. just like to say thank you all for attending today's can webinar. Can you still hear me? Yes, definitely. Okay, my email address on the yes. page, if they just use dick at grazingnaturally.com.au and they use your name and today's date to say they were on this call and they email me at that email address, I'll send them a set of these notes. That would be great. Thank but you, I Dick. I might even add that into the follow-up email so that everyone that attended today can be aware of that. Okay, but I really only want that going to people that were there today just simply because people haven't heard me talk, they read the notes and they start um, wanting to argue about shit they don't understand. Definitely. So um, in closing, everyone, yeah, I'd like to thank you. Thank you for attending today's webinar. And if you could all please take the time to complete the post webinar survey that you should receive following this webinar. It's a great way for you to provide your feedback and to guide me into what future webinars or events you might like to see. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me and I will follow up with you. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you and goodbye.
Thank you very much, Tanisha. Thanks, everyone. Looking forward to hearing from you.